بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا ليبرز السلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, It's uh, absolute pleasure and honor to be speaking here with this kind of really esteemed guests and I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites us uh, in the after and the way he unites us in this dunya under the shade of our Rahman what is it that we're trying to address here? Is it prevent one, prevent two, contest, channel? I get confused, totally I get confused with all of these measures that we keep hearing about. But what's certain is that in the United Kingdom of Great Britain at least, this nation has been here before when it came to the issue of terrorism. But it hasn't reacted in this way ever. In the 70s and the 80s, there was a sustained campaign by the Irish Republican Army or the IRA and up until the 90s which saw the deaths of up to 3,000 people on the British mainland and in Ireland. We saw bombings that were right next door in Warrington, they took place in Guildford, in Birmingham, in Manchester, the Queen's cousin and last Viceroy of India, Lord Mountbatten, was killed by them in 1977. The MI5 building itself, the very heart of the Shaitan, was struck by an improvised rocket, and the queues for the toilets of 10 Downing Street were huge when the IRA fired mortar bombs landing right into the gardens of 10 Downing Street itself. Yet, even though there was a bombing that was taking place as late as 1998 by the real IRA, in which 28 people died in the city of Omar, you never saw the laws the likes of which you see today. You never saw laws that said you can outlaw, under the law of glorification of terrorism, the publication of poetry, the life writing of poetry, in the land of Shakespeare and Wordsworth. You never saw that books that had been written centuries ago were being banned in this country under the notion of not allowing terrorists or the publication of terrorism materials. In fact, this country has taken such a step, I think it would be easy and correct to say, if it was to look at itself in the mirror, it wouldn't be able to recognize itself. The laws and the regulations you have in this country claim, they claim to be ones that civilize the rest of the world. And the proof exists in this. In 1215, King John, while his brother was off fighting the Crusades, and the evidence for their love for this brother, Richard of Lionheart, can be seen right outside Westminster Abbey, where he's sitting with his sword in his hand on his uh, horse, looking powerful and mighty. His brother John was taken to a place called Runnymede in 1215, and was forced by the barons to sign something that's intrinsic to the law of this country, and it's called the Magna Carta. And its central most point is something called habeas corpus, the right to the body. Now, when the, when the Americans took me away from Pakistan, when they kidnapped me from my house and put a gun to my head in the middle of the night, <coughs> it was the lawyers in Pakistan who issued a habeas corpus writ that I'd be either presented to the court or charged. If you go to Kenya or to Uganda or to Pakistan or India or to Australia or America, the effects of this law that happened in 1215 in this country have resonated into the laws of those countries. In 2006 there was a poll, because there's this discussion now, that Muslims need to become and understand and assimilate to the idea of being British. Well, what is that? There was a poll con conducted by the BBC in 2006. And they asked the respondents to say, which is it that's what one single thing that this country, this nation, believes is the most visible sign of quintessential Englishness or Britishness. And the respondents replied by saying, Magna Carta. That, that means, in the central point of this, that no man will be held without charge or trial, except that he be judged by his peers. So then how is it that in 2013, 
we have a government that is protecting and involved in the complicity of torture and detention without trial in Guantanamo, the secret detention sites in Libya, in Syria, in Egypt, all under the name of terrorism. When at the height of the campaign of the IRA, when 3,000 people died, you didn't have such laws. Yes, they had terrible laws. Yes, the Irish people were treated terribly. Yes, they were demonized and they were a criminalized community. But we haven't had 3,000 people die in a conflict with British Muslims. We keep paying the price for something we didn't even agree with. And why is it allowed to ride roughshod, not just over who we are, but our very existence, our very faith? Tony Blair said something very important in relation to what um, this is all about. He said this battle is not, I'm afraid, one between a, a small, unrepresented group of extremists and the rest of us. It is a fundamental struggle for the mind, heart and soul of Islam. That's from Sheikh Tony Blair, talking to us about what Islam is and what it isn't. And his struggle for it because he cares so much for the religions. And he said, after the July 7th points, that the rules of the game have changed. And what are those rules that have changed? They introduced legislation, the likes of which this country has never seen. And we, though not written in law, because they wouldn't dare say that because the Muslims are the de facto recipients, we are the ones who are the recipients of the laws and the measures. That's why you'll find that disproportionately it's Muslims who have been stopped at under the Schedule 7 of the 2000. And, uh, to 2000 terrorism act constantly, regularly, I myself, every single time I was traveling, that was happening too. Jamir mentioned that 37 people have had their passports, have had their nationalities, their nationalities taken away. 36 of those people were Muslims. One of them was an alleged Russian spy. What does the facts and the statistics tell you? In the audience, we have a brother who was convicted, convicted, I tell you. For nothing except the distribution and publication of books, some of which were written in the 12th century. Books that were written, other books that were written at the time when Britain was supporting, supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. What's the story behind that? If you look in the mountains of Snowdonia and in the highlands of Scotland, Britain bought over Mujahideen and from Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation and was training them. And it trained them in the use of the blowpipe anti-aircraft missile system, which being British turned out to be totally crap, and was replaced by the Stinger, which had a seven to 10 kill ratio of those devil's chariots, which you see, uh, those helicopters, which you'll see are represented in Rambo 3. They glorified Mujahideen at that time. Today, the brothers talk about Syria. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I spent some months in Syria last year. And the British intelligence services were aware of this. The reason why they were aware of this is because before I left, they asked to speak to me. And I said to them, I'm going to Syria, but one of the things I'm going to be doing there is investigating you. They're my five. Because I know, through my investigations, when I went to Libya and to Egypt and to other places in Tunisia, I know, and you know, that you were complicit handing over individuals to these tyrannical regimes in order that they be tortured. In fact, when I was held in Bahram and being tortured by the Americans, and with you physically present, I remember I told you that they said to me if I don't cooperate with them, they will send me either to Syria or to Egypt. Your buddies when it comes to torture. So I'm going there to investigate you and your involvement in handing over people to Bashar al-Assad's regime which they did during the war on terror. So they said, okay, we need to go speak to our lawyers. Imagine that MI5 is telling me they need to speak to their lawyers. I said, fine, you bring your lawyers and I'll bring mine. We'll have a show that. And we did. And we spoke and I went and I said, if I get hindered from going there, I'll know that it's you, but you are the ones who stop me. And they did it. And alhamdulillah, I went to Syria and I met many people there. And I saw 
the atrocity, and I spoke to several prisoners, some of whom had been renditioned, including one who had been handed over because of what the British had done. They don't like this stuff to come out. They don't like Muslims to stand up and say, yes, we know you're watching us, but Wallah we're watching you right back. They don't like it. They don't like anybody who's uppity enough to say this. They don't like anybody who should, should be after years of torture and abuse and uh, fear and threats and so forth and being harassed at their courts. They don't like you standing up. And as Allah subhanahu wa says, يُرِيدُونَ لِيُؤْفُ نُورَ اللَّهِ بِيَقْوَاهِ وَاللَّهُ مُتُمْ بِنُورِي وَلَوْ كَرِيَ الْكَافِرُونَ That they wish to extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their mouths. وَاللَّهُ مُتُمْ بِنُورِي And Allah will protect his light even though the pagans detest it. And this is precisely what's happening, my dear brothers and sisters. They don't like the people on this planet. They don't like you either. They don't like anybody that will stand up against the system. And as I said before, it happened before in the past. Brothers have mentioned it before, from the black civil rights movement, to the Irish movements, to the other movements. But here, there is a big difference. Because they were either nationalist movements or a movement about a particular strain. This one is global. It goes right across the board. It spans across territories and continents and peoples. It spans across colors and cultures. It goes from the Americas to Europe to North Africa and right across Asia. And it has the potential of uniting us in a way that nothing could be united. The evidence of it, they call this a war on terror. But I ask you, if it's a war on terror, why were there no Tamil tigers who are known to carry out suicide bombings in Guantanamo Bay? Why were there no real IRA members or the continuity IRA who still carry out attacks in the North Island? Not to say that they don't have problems in there, not to say that the Irish community that is not facing its own demons from the British state. But I ask you, if it's really just a war on terror, why is it the first condition of any person held in Guantanamo or Babra or Abu Ghraib or anywhere else here that they have to be able to? Why was it that everybody was extradited from the detainee unit in the Long Latin with Barbara Ahmed? and Tala Ahsan, and Abdul ba Adil Abdul Bari, and Khalil Fawaz, and all these brothers, how come it was only that these people were only Muslims? Why? So if this is your war on terror, and it's against terrorism across the board, <coughs> then what about those people who carried out acts of terrorism against Muslims, including British soldiers? And I mean on the, here on the mainland, people who carried out acts of violence at mosques, people who attacked Muslims, people who have carried out atrocities. Why is it one-sided? Why is there a double standard? Why is there such duplicity? Part of the problem, my dear brothers and sisters, I have to say, is because of us ourselves. In Allah, is that we have often sat back and watched these things that happen, buried our heads in the sands like an ostrich and suggested that if we stay quiet, perhaps it will pass us by. And as Jamdiya said, had this been seven years ago, this room would have 12 people, majority of whom would be in intelligence services. Why are you all here, after all? What do you feel connected to this issue? Have you perhaps been stopped at the airport once or twice? Profiled? Stopped and searched? Maybe a relative detained under anti-terror legislation? Maybe got on a convoy to Syria and detained? It's going to get worse, dear brothers and sisters. They have already announced that any of the brothers who are supposed to be in any way linked to any of the groups that are fighting, that they will have their nationality removed. They are saying that there's at least 300 of them, maybe more. Imagine removing the nationality of 300 Muslims. That's just the beginning of this process. It's much more serious. And while we're at it, when we're looking at something like Syria, Yes, there are all kinds of groups there, extremist groups and groups that have gone way overboard. But this government, based on dodgy evidence, went to war quite willingly in Iraq on the notion or the premise, the idea, the possibility, the maybe, that there could be weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, though it was proved to be false. Yet weapons of mass destruction have been used without a question, without a shadow of a doubt, in Syria. 
chemical weapons, sarin and gas has been used against them, as well as conventional weapons that has killed thousands, hundreds of thousands, 120,000. Yet the people who go there to assist, though there is no existential threat to the United Kingdom at all, no threat at all to Britain, anybody who goes over there at least will be detained at the ports of entry exit in this country. And at worst, will have their nationality revoked. They have attempted to try to prosecute people, including a doctor who helped save hostages. He helped to save hostages in Syria, but he came back and got arrested. If Dr. Abbas Khan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept him into his mercy and in a jannah and fardos in Al, had he returned alive, what do you think would have happened to him? You think the intelligence services wouldn't have bothered about him? You think he wouldn't have been on their radar? You think that they wouldn't have started? They even did. Some of the media began it to start asking questions about what was he really there for? As if there can be no benign reason to go to Syria. If you go to Syria, you must be, if you're a Muslim, mark my word, only if you're a Muslim, because had a non-Muslim gone there, there'd be no such problem. And this is the world, my brothers and sisters, that we are entering. The next phase is here, and we will be tested. We will be tested even more than we will be tested now. And the time for firmness has come, the time for sleep is over. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability to stand firm in the face of the oppression that's going to come.